Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. The little pollen, it gets in, gets in my eyes and, uh, well, you know what happens. So have you ever been in a place where you were completely out of hope? where life has just ground and ground and ground on you and you're beat up and you're exhausted and you have no hope, you don't know which way you're going to go and you're just worn out, exhausted, just done. That is a place of no hope. It is a place of exhaustion. And, you know, I, I think we've all been to those kind of places in life. We've all just come to the end of ourselves and the end of all of our own resources. And and it's interesting that in our scripture today, it starts out with what I would suggest are two people who are exhausted. There are two people who are tired in this story. Um, The first one that's tired in this story is Jesus. We don't often think of Jesus as being tired, but it says that. It says Jesus was tired and he was tired from his journey. He wasn't tired from the journey, okay? To be tired from the journey would be to be tired because you've been walking. To be tired from his journey, I I only have to import, and we could get all into the Greek, but I come to this conclusion. He's tired because of what he's been going through and what he's been doing. He's been on this journey. He's been trying to teach and his God bless his disciples, they're not getting it. And I just can picture that they've been arguing on this trail for a while. Anybody been on a long journey with a group of people in a small car? Yeah, y'all are getting it now. There comes a point in time when I'm just going to let y'all all all out of the car, and I'm going to go do something different. We were in Colorado one time. We had a a car full of uh, relatives We had three cars full of relatives. We had all traveled together. And there came a point in time where I was just tired of everybody. So I looked at everybody and I said, I'm going to go into the mountains today. I'm leaving town. I'm going to go hiking. And anybody who wants to come can come, but they are not allowed to speak. I turned around and looked into the back of the minivan, and all the teenagers were in the car with me. And I looked at them, and I go, y'all know the rules? And God bless their hearts, they just smiled. They didn't even say anything. I was like, you guys, you're going to be okay. I think Jesus was tired. Y'all go ahead and go to town. I'm going to sit down here. Now, we can easily picture why the woman from the well, the Samaritan woman was tired, can't we? She'd been ostracized by society. She, I, I can only envision she had made bad decisions. Bad things had happened. She, you ever made bad decisions and they just give you worse decisions and worse, you paint yourself into a corner? And then there's societal rules that may have painted her into a corner. There was difficulty upon difficulty. She was out of friends. She was by herself. She was having to go get water in the middle of the day. I imagine that she was a person who is at the end of her rope and exhausted and without hope. And so here we have two very tired people who meet at the well. Jesus starts the conversation with, would you give me a drink? Now, we, we miss the importance of this because culturally, we live in a land of Ozorka water bottles. Praise be to God. I don't know about you, but I really like their water. But there's a connotation that comes with asking for water in the Middle East. It is not only asking for water, but you're asking for hospitality. So there's an idea of hospitality that comes along with it. If you, if you look at somebody and say, would you give me a drink of water? It means that I wish to also be 
in relationship with you and to be within your care. And so it is an establishing a rapport and a, a way of getting to know one another and to be in relationship and to be protected in the family system because the family system was how protection took place. And so this was shocking to her. First of all, he's Jewish, she's Samaritan, he's a man, she's a woman, and, and there is within this question the cultural construct of, I want to be your friend, would you be my friend? So, you know, one of the things that's interesting in the world is if you break a law, they'll fine you or maybe give you a ticket or maybe put you in jail. You break a cultural construct and you get in real trouble. And here Jesus was breaking these social norms and he says, would you give me some water? It then gets flipped on its head because he then offers her living water, which we're going to go over in a moment, and he said, if you knew who I was, then you'd be asking me. It, it, it flips the whole thing over the other direction going, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for the relationship. If you knew what I brought, then you would be asking me to become a part of my family and to be under my protection. He has turned the tables upside down on this. But he also says... Uh, that's within that, you know, the book of John is so great. There's so much symbolism that's put in the middle of it. Uh, and he puts right in there, if you, you, you would ask for the living water. Now, living water has a very particular connotation within the Jewish structure. Uh, living water had a legal definition. It had to be flowing from a stream. So it had to be coming from uphill to downhill it had to be flowing of a natural waterway, or it had to fall from the sky. It did not come from cisterns, and so it was something that had a constant flow to it. Not only did it have a constant flow to it, but it was also the requirement for a mikvah. Now, a mikvah was one of the first things that would often get built in a Jewish community, even before they would build a sanctuary or a, a place of worship they would build a place where you would wash and the water would have to run into it and then also run out of it. It was a place where you would wash. When we were in the Holy Land, one of the things that's interesting, if you go to where the Dead Sea Scrolls are, uh, y'all seen the pictures of where the Dead Sea Scrolls are, right? It's out in the middle of the wilderness, very much a desert. There's the caves that are up there and right behind you is the Dead Sea. Now, I'm telling you this whole story because they had mikvahs, and they were what we would call a, a, a hyper-religious society. So if it said you were supposed to do something, they went to great extents to get it done. So they had to have living water. So they built extensive channels. They expensed extensive amounts of digging to where they had water come from an upper part of the cliff. It would come all the way down. It would run. All this said that their mikvahs had running water in the middle of the desert. Now, this is a determined group of people now. But what's interesting about the word mikvah is it also translates as hope. Hope. For the living water in washing us gives us hope. Hope to be clean. Hope to be in God's presence. Uh, the idea was this living water brought in hope that we are washed in the hope of God. So Jesus offers her this. Let me give you the hope of God that will wash you. And God bless her heart. She's a little like the Nicodemus last week. She, she takes this in a literal form and fashion, right? And says, oh yes, give me that water so I don't have to come to the well. I don't have to do this all the time. Uh, she's a little slow on the uptake. Um, you know, when you're exhausted, when you're tired, when you're out of your own resources, we slow down, don't we? You know, there's research that shows that we lose intelligence when we're in that place. Like, it's measurable. So, so you know when we get out of the more clever part of our brains when we're exhausted. And so 
She, she misses what's going on here. And then they go into this conversation about worship. The theological conversation about worship. And, well, yes, I would like to have... I would like to have this hope. I would like to have this thing of worship. But you say that I have to go all the way over there to worship. You ever notice that when we run out of hope, what, would you, what do we first turn to? Uh, I don't know about you, but I come up with excuses for why I'm having a pity party. Do y'all have excuses for why you throw a pity party? Right? Well, that's not going to work because of this. And that's not going to work because of this. Um, now, that's not what the text says, but it makes a lot of sense that she's in a place of, I can't get done what needs to get done because you've got all these rules causing all these problems. And, and Jesus then says, turns back to the attention of worship, worship in truth and in spirit. And then you can worship anywhere. So now we've kind of entered into this theological conversation, this banter back and forth. Okay, well, I, I get what you're putting down here, but all of that will be fixed. All of that will be fixed when the Messiah comes. She knows. It's going to be fixed when the Messiah comes. Now, in the midst of this, she's decided to go ahead and enter into this theological conversation because why? Because Jesus has said something about her life. He said, if you want this living water, you need to go get your husband. Well, I don't have one. Well, no, you don't. You've had five. You see, he puts his finger on this particular reason she's been through so much difficulty. Jesus knows all of the problems that we've lived with. I know my problems will be resolved when the Messiah comes. And he tells her right upon that, I am the Messiah. Now what's great is, unless you're paying attention, you miss what her reaction is. Her reaction is beautiful and wonderful. She gets up, she leaves her water jar, and she goes to town. Now, I just picture that she went in a hurry. Now, what did she come for? She came for water. And I'm going to give you some news. She left with water. She left with the living water. She came looking for just regular water, and she left excited with wonderful water. You see, John included this one detail. What? She left her jar. There's a man named Chekhov who uh, writes about how you're supposed to tell stories. Uh, he does this wonderful thing. There's a thing called Chekhov's gun. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. You've got to be a real nerd to know this one. It says if you're writing a story and you include the detail that there is a gun over the top of the fireplace, at some point that gun has to go off. You know, if you include a detail somewhere in the story, later you have to include the detail so that your audience will have satisfaction. Uh, John didn't read Chekhov. But he did include the detail. And what's this wonderful detail? She abandoned her jar and she went to town. Folks, I think one of the things that we miss all the time is that when we pick up the joy that comes upwelling out of us, we leave something behind. And she left the dead water, and she left with water that was welling up out of her soul. She left with this joy, this excitement, this hope. Why in the world would people follow her out of town to go see Jesus? Uh, she was a person that nobody would believe. She was a person that nobody had a relationship with. She went to town and town came back with her. I'm going to submit to you, there was something different. She went to town gushing hope. Welling up out of her soul, running out all over everybody. And people then came. What's precious about the story next 
is then the disciples, God bless their heart. It's a great thing about East Texas. You can say that and then say anything. God bless their heart. They couldn't figure out what had happened to Jesus. Well, he's talking to a woman. I don't know about this, guys. They didn't bring it up. Then they're like, maybe we should give him something to eat. And what's Jesus' response to that? I already have had food. Jesus went from exhausted to elated. He went from tired to happy, to fulfilled. Because he had reached her and he knew that the harvest was on. The harvest was on. I, I'm going to break some news to you. You know the easiest people to evangelize to are the people who are in need of hope. The reason the world was ripe for harvest is because the world is filled with people who've been ground up and spit out and chewed up and beaten up and hurt and broken. And they need hope. They need the love of Christ. We need the love of Christ. And what does Jesus say? The fields are ripe. You don't seem to be paying attention. And then they came out, and they didn't just hear her words, they heard Jesus' words. She gave them enough living water to where they came and got their own living water. You know, folks, I think the, jo the job of the church is to be a hope-filled people. I think the job of the preacher is to pour hope out on you. If I don't do anything ever else, is, it is to pour hope upon you so that you may take hope out into the world, that you may be filled up with living water. I was speaking with a preacher the other day, a friend of mine, and he's a little bit discouraged, and he was discouraged by all what was going on, and he said, you know, the people I preach to, they don't have any hope. They don't have any joy, and I said, well, give them some. Good grief, man. Uh, one story, and see if I can bring this back together. Uh, there, you, you guys know by now I'm a movie buff, and so one of my favorite movies is Moneyball, which is a story about a man who takes over, or he's been running a team, and they keep losing at the final game. They can't win, they can't win, they can't win. And they've got to find some other way to do it. And so there is a guy they're going to sign and recruit, and nobody else will sign him. His name is Hatterberg. He was a catcher, and he had unrepairable nerve damage in his throwing arm. Now, if you're a catcher, you have to be able to throw, or everybody is going to steal bases on you forever. Like, your career is over. And so they break into this scene, and he's sitting on his couch, and he is without hope, man. He's got none. And so they hire him, they bring him in, they give him a job, and they're like, look, you're not a catcher anymore. Now you're a first baseman. And he's not so sure about it. And like, he doesn't know that he can do this. He's very tentative about it. And the coaches are talking about him. And the coach says the easiest way to put this, the nicest way to put it, is he lacks confidence. To which the main player in this movie, Billy Bean, says, well, then give him some. Give him some encouragement. That's what the word encourage means, to put courage in someone. In courage. Look, you know, I think the reason people would want to come to church. I think the reason that people would want to be in relationship with God is because it is a place of hope. It is a place where it is unreasonable hope that comes welling out of us. So before I send you out to do evangelism, before I send you out to go tell people about it, the first thing I would tell you is first drink of the water that is living. First, fill yourself with the living water until it flows out of you. And then people will see it in you and want to know where it comes from.
The fields are ripe. And I encourage you that you may be filled with the living water and set down the dead stuff. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.